here, I've been hearing all the time that mobile is all about video and that video is intrinsically mobile. There seems to be this assumption that's shared by all sides or many sides of the industry that mobile and video pretty much go hand in hand. So why is there this notion that, that video is going mobile? And uh, when we look at consumer behavior, do you see that consumers are really spending so much time watching video on mobile mm. devices? Ed, how about you? Um, I think, yeah, people are going mobile, right? I mean, we all know from our own behavior that we're spending more and more time on our, on our mobile phones. Uh, in the UK specifically, I think last year was the first time that digital overtook television as the most popular form of media by time spent, and that clearly was fueled by mobile, essentially. Um, at Facebook and Instagram, we have some big numbers. So we have uh, 4 billion video views every single day. 75% uh, of those are actually on mobile. And if I was to think about to this time last year, most of you were probably just or if, either were pouring ice cold water on your head or just poured ice cold water on your head from the ice bucket challenge, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. And we thought that was a real high uh, point in our video uh, numbers. But then if I look from that time to this time this year, video posts in the UK are, are up 88%. So we think this is a kind of fundamental shift of consumer behavior, essentially. And part of a, a wider move, we think, of um, consumers move into a more visual-based language, so sight, sound, and motion. We're sending more stickers and emojis, and we're posting more images. I think the fundamental consumer part is that us as human beings process and digest information in, in visual form much quicker than we do words. And mobile phones are helping us do that, essentially. And then why is it so important to ask the, this question around mobile video? Because obviously, even today, we have a panel that's specifically focused mm -hmm. on the mobile question. So what are the, um, the opportunities that, that, video, that mobile creates for video? How is mobile video different from um, video on a PC or on a, on, on a TV, for example? I think it comes down to when people have some free time. So anybody who commutes or takes the train, you have some free time there where you want to watch catch up on episode. So you might plan out and you might say, okay, download EastEnders onto my iPlayer and I'm going to watch it when I'm on the, the train or the tube. So this wasn't around before. We weren't really able to do this. People could open their laptops, but you can't really bring your desktop with you when you're moving. So we've become totally addicted to our mobiles. Um, I was on the, the lift today and there was a person in the mobile just doing this. We, we have to be on our mobiles all the time. It's, it's almost like, um, yeah, it's, it's a form of addiction. So Mobile devices are here, they're, they're being used a lot, and video is just a way to be able to watch what you want, when you want, in front of you, when you've got the time to be able to do it, whether that's on the move, yeah. or commuting, or, or wherever else it is. So it's I becoming part of our daily life. Uh, yeah, I think we've become um, so much more used to using our smartphones, tablets. I commute on the train into, into London every day, and every day there's a, at least a handful of people that are sat watching a catch-up episode, something on their, on their phone, they're plugged into their, their headphones. So I think that's sort of, re, that's changed our, our, our perspective on kind of viewing video on that type of device. Instead of it being watching that kind of content, it's got to be on a mm -hmm. big TV, it's got to be really high quality, it's all about the, the highest definition screen. Actually, it's quite acceptable to sit and watch something on a five-inch mm -hmm. screen because it's more convenient, it fills that dead time with that multitude of new episodes of different series, box sets, whatever that I'm, that I'm trying to, to catch up on. And I think that then means that people are, are also, because they're used to watching some sort of video on their phone, the mm. types of video that they see on, on Facebook become much more kind of acceptable to, to have video yeah. on your handset. And then the, the smartphone integration of the camera, the video camera, the ease of which People can take video, can share video via Facebook, via Twitter, via Snapchat, via all these different services, means that there's just so much content that's being created all of the time. Yeah, it's interesting point, isn't it? For me, and I agree that it's this kind of palm your hand, you can see thing, but it's also this idea of discovery, I think. So we know that search is predominantly a PC laptop based. Uh, activity and that obviously decreased on your phone and I think your phone then becomes this kind of window into the world where you kind of discover new things so I'm a bit of a Star Wars geek <laughs> and I saw the latest trailer or the final trailer yesterday and um, imagine if I was to ask the well, actually I will ask you ask you who saw the, the Star Wars trailer yesterday for the new films just a show of hands keep your hand up if you saw that on your mobile first yeah most people because 
I think this, this idea of discovering new things happens on your mobile device. Now, obviously, I'm biased, but I also think it happens on Facebook as well. But essentially, you're in this mindset of entertain me, what's happening? You know, and I think that's where you kind of discover new things on mobile. Now, you might want to go and watch that again on your laptop or your big 52-inch screen because it's better quality. But that idea of entering your consciousness for the first time, finding out about new stuff, discovery, I think happens on your phone. And I think that's also fueling more usage as well. That's uh, mainly true for us. Mobile devices, actually, I mean, uh, the first device that consumer uh, open to look at the weather and then they move into television on desktop if they want to. Uh, get better uh, deep content about something that is not just the forecast. So mobile is what we use actually to engage the customer in the first step and then they move to other devices uh, to get more information. And uh, I mean, I think the mobile first nature is a bit, uh, mm. I mean, related to other companies. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. At least yeah. We, yeah. we enter the app more than once a day to quick yeah. check what's going on with the forecast. Mm. And then, you know, video is actually a focus of our new strategy because we need to be able to just not uh, give forecasts but tell something the customers about the weather. They are curious to understand what there is behind and the video is definitely the creatives that maybe give us the better opportunity to engage with them in a just a short period of time. I think, uh, I mean, mobile and video for us is a really a reality a focus of our strategy since uh, last year. So if we get a, see if we take a, a step back and a look at this question, you all seem to be pretty positive. Do you think we are entering a decade of mobile video, or do you think it's maybe a little bit overhyped still in the context of the other devices that consumers are, are, are using? I, I, when we look through the world from our telescope, we think fundamentally we're in that decade now. Absolutely. I, I, I think it, the decade of, of mobile video is... is only slightly less annoying than the, than the year of mobile, <laughs> which I've been battered with for the last 10 years. Um, I, I, I don't think it's, it's about a year or a decade of, of mobile video. I think it's about how consumer behaviors are changing, how we're doing things. Mm. We're doing everything on our mobiles. It's not just about video. So, you know, to your point about discovery, of course people are discovering things on their mobile because that's the device that they have with them and that they use when they've got minutes, mm. hours to, to, to fill. Whereas when you go to your, your desktop, your laptop, it tends to be a lot more task focused. You go in there because you have to renew your car insurance. Mm. And it's too cumbersome to do on your, mm. on your handset. So that's really, it's, it's a, a shift of behavior to mobile rather than it being about mobile video, mobile advertising, mobile content. If you look at it a different way as well, everything is shifting mobile. So the number of people who are using a desktop is very few. Most people who are working, most people in, in the audience, would be using a laptop to, to work on. They'll have a mobile phone and they'll have a tablet. So uh, technically, it's all mobile. Your TV is fixed because it's usually quite big, 50 or, or above. Um, desktops are usually for people who need high-powered machines, so if they're working in operations or they're working in design. If you don't, Processing power is enough in a laptop to be able to get done what you need to get done. So picking up your device and moving with it, whether it's a phone, whether it's a tablet, or whether it's, it's a laptop, the whole world is going mobile. So in, I think in, as, as well, when you look at, if you take out kind of work-based mm. activity, then it's almost entirely tablets or smartphones. Yeah. Mm. You know, you might use your laptop at home for, like you say, if you're doing kind of any video editing or photo editing, yeah. kind of collating a, a photo album, that type of thing. But outside of that, for general browsing, general information, general Facebook activity, YouTube activity, mm. you're probably using a phone. And even if you're using, you know, kind of, uh, kind of looking at video on, on YouTube or iPlayer, something like that, then you either have a, a smart TV or you're looking at it on your smartphone, your tablet, and then you're casting it to the TV. So it's, yeah. I've got, I've got a big desktop gaming machine, but it's an antique. Yeah. <laughs> I have it just because I'm a geek and I like gaming, mm. but it's not practical. It, it, it's just there because it's, it's kind of like, yeah, an antique feature that I have in the corner to kind of look good. <laughs> well, Show sure, off your geek yeah. gaming credentials. Yeah, look good is kind of a <laughs> subjective term, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> to be in the club. Yeah. Yeah. So if we, if we all agree that video um, viewing is going mobile, um, that obviously has implications for how the content is being produced and how the video ads are, are being produced as well. Everything needs to um, be easily consumable on a, on a mobile device and everything mm. has to look good. So 
Um, there still seems to be a, a bit of a gap there because when I see video ads on mobile devices, I still see a lot of TV ads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So where does this disconnect come from? And I'm looking at you two specifically because <laughs> you have the publisher, maybe perspective on this, and then and then UG did the, the more agency uh, advertiser side of the story. I mean, for the Weather Channel, as we said, the video has been a central in the last uh, year because we recognize there is a huge potentiality in terms of revenue, but we also realize it's the best format to engage with our audience. Uh, the biggest challenge we are currently facing is to try to produce uh, in-house customized content for one mobile device, going away from this uh, TV mindset of producing a video. Uh, the peculiarity of the device forces us to rethink not just about the creative, but also about the content. And when I talk about creative and content, I mean uh, to think about uh, the length of the video that we are going to display on mobile cannot be the same of what we are proposing to our users on TV or desktop. Then there is an issue related to the size of the creative because connectivity on Wi-Fi on mobile devices sometimes can be an issue. So we need to be able also to consider which is the user experience in terms of data load. And sometimes, especially in certain countries where internet is not so uh, developed like maybe the UK, consumers sometimes have to pay additional price to their uh, internet service provider for, based on the amount of data <coughs> they download. As a media owner, if I want my users to come back to my property and use on a daily basis, I cannot forget about the peculiarity of the device I'm using for. In terms of content, this means also to be able to create strong storytelling that are able to engage our users in just 40 seconds. It's not easy. We're also a global company, so this means we're also uh, facing uh, the production of video in different languages, culture, uh, countries, uh, uh, this means that not all the time we have in-house the resources to produce uh, all this amount of video. So sometimes we need to find a balance between uh, entertaining a big audience, but also find content that could be easily translated into different languages and be useful for different people with different mentality, approach, and culture. So definitely I would say it's the biggest, biggest challenge we are facing, but uh, we're putting again uh, mobile optimizing website and video optimized content are the center of our strategy. Everything from video to editorial content needs to be customized and think for mobile. Our video will be completely customized and optimized to be shared on social media, on uh, you know, other websites helping us to reach even a bigger audience. That's what we are doing. So I, th I think it's interesting, I agree actually, very few brands are creating specific work for mobile. Um, we talk a lot internally about uh, passing the three second audition, that in a newsfeed environment, we think brands have around three seconds to grab your attention essentially as you're moving through and your newsfeed. And we're not saying that content or ads need to be three seconds in length, but they absolutely need to capture someone's attention in, the, in those first three seconds or you, or you just move past. And we are seeing some really forward-thinking brands do that. And I shared some examples yesterday on, on the stage around how you can make content more relevant, essentially. How you can make, you can take your existing 30-second or 90-second TV spot, but can you recut it, re-engineer it to make it more relevant? And that could be uh, changing the opening frame or even the opening thumbnail. And what we find is, and using an example of Everything Everywhere, EE and the Kevin Bacon campaign, uh, buffer face, that when we created specific work, then actually you are twice as likely to actually watch that in video in its entirety, and you're twice as likely to click on that video and go and visit the website as well. So when you get this right, it does actually drive better results for advertisers. I think from, from the advertiser perspective, it's about being a, having to create that mobile-specific content. So mm. it's very easy, you know, kind of the, everybody's used to shooting a 30-second TV ad, the creative agency have their big budgets for that and go to nice glamorous locations, high production values on it. Uh, and then if we say we want to have a, a, a mobile specific version with a slightly different start or we want uh, to be able to have different versions for different, different audiences, then it becomes quite difficult for people to kind of conceptually understand mm. that particularly when you look at sort of TV budgets versus mobile video budgets. Uh, TV budgets in terms of media obviously being massive, 
mobile video budgets being, if we're lucky, mm -hmm. in kind of tens of thousands of pounds. So the cost potentially to shoot that specific creative for mobile could be at least as much as the actual mm. media spend. So that's, that's part of the problem. Um, yeah, I, I think, think right, there's, there's no business model for creative agencies yet. Yeah, they haven't yeah. worked out how to make money. And often I think when they've done the big shoot in Barbados or whatever glamorous location, when they come to review that ad then, it's probably in the boardroom on a huge screen or 52 inch screen with surround sounds. But we do see brands and some of them like Mondelez and Cabaret's that actually review their work on a mobile phone. How is the consumer going to actually see this? And instead of having that in a creative review on a big screen, they all have a phone and, and look at that work. And I think start, we do see some moves to kind of understand yeah. what that might mean. I think as, as people do start to review it on the mobile phone, though, hopefully they'll start to realise that if they're shooting mobile-specific creative, there's an, an argument that you should be doing it in a vertical perspective rather than mm. a horizontal perspective. Because mm. you take that, um, you know, whether it's the Star Wars trailer or uh, any, you know, any, any bit of video content, and not only are you seeing it on a five and a half inch screen, but you're actually seeing it that way. Yeah. And it's just this tiny band across the yeah. middle of this screen mm -hmm. and you're kind of wasting two thirds of the actual screen inventory. Whereas if you turn that and start actually shooting portrait mode for video specific for mobile, then it makes a lot more sense on that device. And that's the way that consumers are shooting video. If they're shooting anything on their mobile phone, they're not turning their phone around like this because they're used to taking photos in a portrait mode. Yeah. And they take video in exactly the same way. They share video in exactly the mm. same way. So it makes absolute sense from a creative perspective for us to actually start thinking about not just the kind of three second audition, mm. the length of the, of the, 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 the <laughs> advert versus the content, but also kind of the, the orientation that we yeah. shoot it in. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a huge issue for, for the industry that this is happening, that there's a 30 second ad being put on mobile and expected that to be acceptable. Um, Barbara mentioned earlier on about if you have a 15 piece of content, 15 second piece of content and a 30 second ad before it, it's just crazy. So I think as an industry we need to grow up a little bit. Um, the agencies do need to be rewarded and, and the clients need to pay a little bit more to have this editing done so that you're meeting consumer demand, that you get that three second impact and then it rolls out to a 10 second ad. But to have 30 seconds just for the sake of it, it, it will balance out because people will start turning against brands and mm. skipping ads and, and just getting a bit cross. I think one of the missing pieces, I think, is around how mobile can create fame for advertisers, essentially, that we know outdoor and telly is great at doing that. And if I use Can as a barometer of successful mobile campaigns and, and you know, who won what lion or who won a gold lion, very few are mobile. And I think there's this notion that actually it can be invisible, that actually not the whole industry doesn't see it and doesn't create that fame. And I think that's a challenge that we all need to rise to is about how can mobile and mobile video create real fame for an advertiser? I think part of that is, is that, you know, when we as uh, agencies, you guys as, as kind of media owners, clients, you know, the, the whole industry, when we're at work, when we're dealing with this type of content, when we're reviewing it, mm. we're doing it on a laptop, possibly putting it up onto yeah. a bigger monitor. So that's the, that's the kind of world that we think mm. in. Mm. We don't think about our consumers that aren't sat at their desk all day with a monitor watching this kind of film. Mm. They're watching it on their mobile phone. And I think it's that kind of work to personal balance that we kind of forget about because we're kind of professionals and we're in that environment. For us, as I said, I think our app, our uh, property is offered already a kind of uh, ideal environment for brands uh, to engage with their customers because there is a lot of uh, emotions, a story related to the weather, and so we actually offering them the perfect environment to recreate this emotion and to engage better with their brand, with their consumers. However, one of the biggest challenges we are facing on mobile creativity nowadays, especially on the programmatic side, is literally the lack of creatives that have a short length and can be adapted to the short length of our content. As we said, if you display an ad, a pre-roll ad that is longer than the, ad con that the content you are watching could be very frustrating. Yeah. Adding on top that sometimes those ads are not even related to the targets uh, who is uh, watching the, the ads, I mean, you wouldn't surprise that consumers get really annoyed and advertisers are frustrated too. Mm -hmm. So on one side, we have the buyers complaining that there is not enough premium inventory for uh, video and uh, pre-rolls. But on the other side, you have the publisher complaining that no, all those creatives are actually customized yeah. for our needs. And so 
How much resistance is there, and maybe that's more a question for you, Gide, but how much resistance is there on the advertising side to having shorter creatives and, and to move away from the 30 second TV spot? Is that something that they're open to or is that something you still pretty much have to coach them on every, every time you speak to them? It's pretty much something that you have to coach them on every time that you speak to them. It's, you know, we're, we're just about getting to the stage where we can expect to get reasonably optimized mobile display creative. Um, and that should be relatively easy. But again, you know, the way that the creative agencies are, are recompensed means that it's not really in their interest to, to, to go into that too much. And often it's sort of the most junior people that are, oh, just knock up this 300 by 50 or 300 by 250 uh, ad for, for mobile. Um, so it's still a, a very much an, an ongoing conversation that you have to be constantly showing uh, client on a device, this is what your ad's going to look like, are you happy with that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, kind of saying, this is what your ad could look like, doesn't that look so much better? Um, and I think, you know, perhaps to an extent we're also guilty of that, being stuck in the, in the work mindset. So we go to a client and we do a big presentation on this is what your, you know, media strategy is going to be and it's done on a laptop, on PowerPoint and projected up onto a big screen. Um, and there's very little sort of, this is, these are the sites, this is what it looks like, this is the actual uh, customer experience when they tap on the ad, go through, this is what they can do, this is how it looks. It tends just to be sort of a couple of screenshots on a, on a big screen. So I think it, it's something that we all need to get into our minds is that, you know, yes, we're at work, but that's not the real world. There's kind of the real world outside of the office. And, and the creative is one, one part of the equation, but there's also a whole question around what's the uh, viewing experience for, for the consumer going on a mobile device, on a mobile phone or on a tablet. Um, how do you make sure that the player um, is, is mobile friendly, that, that the whole experience matches the device? So, um, yeah, and we've done a lot of work actually to try and help understand that. So obviously you know your, from your Facebook experience that your sound is default off and around 50% of people then keep that sound default off actually. And I think that's important both for, uh, for brands when they think about how do we create work in a world that is sound default off. And uh, we talked about the portrait versus landscape uh, environment as well. And then also we've, we have announced a whole bunch of tools and new kind of experiences just in, across a few weeks, how you can kind of watch later, so you can kind of bookmark it for watch later, how you can drag it out of a window and move it down to your right hand corner so it kind of keeps playing as you move through newsfeed at the same time. So I think we're beginning to understand what that consumer behavior is around how they consume and how they want video. Um, the other thing we do is if we're running uh, video activity for campaigns, then it's a real simple thing, but essentially we request the copy for that campaign a couple of days out before the live date, and actually we start to put it into people's cache. So that's how we get to autoplay. Uh, so, so you kind of help try and reduce some of that buffering time. So we're kind of preloading it essentially onto people's phones. And then you have a much more seamless experience because of that. And obviously we're working really hard on kind of compression sizes, uh, especially because we don't want to eat up into people's uh, data plans. So if we move away a little bit from this question of, of, um, of, of creation or creative um, and more to the question of distribution. Um, and, and let's talk about programmatic because I, I don't want to be I remember as the one panel that didn't talk about programmatic in these uh, two days. Um, so how much, of, uh, how much of that is already happening in mobile video specifically? For us, uh, programmatic on mobile video is a reality. Uh, first of all, because uh, most of our uh, uh, traffic came from mobile device. And uh, in all those countries where we don't have a direct uh, sales force uh, on the market, 100% uh, of the revenue came from programmatic monetization. From London, we're able to look after 190 countries, uh, and that's quite uh, impressive. It wouldn't be possible without the automation technology. So we're, we're doing more and more programmatic video. It's still a, a fairly small percentage of the total, but it is something that we're kind of looking at more and more and trying to work into strategies and plans to, to take to clients. Yeah. There was a lot of talk yesterday about premium <clears throat> video. Um, I think mobile can really address this um, because if you're looking at a video ad on desktop or on, on your laptop, it's happening on that screen, you can switch, you can go and check your Facebook, you can go and do something else while the ad is playing. With mobile, a lot of the time you can't do that because it's coming up on your whole screen. So if you're trying to get a campaign, particularly if we're going to try and move 
TV budget into online. Mobile has a big part to play in that because of the fact that you can actually get the message across. You know someone's looking at it. They're not looking away or they're not, well, they can look away, but they're not looking at a different screen. And that's something that will really help. So there was a, a one of the panelists on yesterday was talking about how mobile is now 20% of their inventory. I think this is something that's really, really positive because the more that people do consume um, sites on mobile, the more that we can get a message in front of people on that device in, in a proper way and with the right time, it doesn't have to be the 30 seconds, but that will really help to shift and give confidence to TV buyers to be able to move their budget from TV to online, knowing that the message is going to be seen. Do you think that's part of potentially a double-edged sword because at least on desktop you can do something else, maybe when the, run, the ad <laughs> runs on mobile, if it takes the whole screen and you want to ignore it, you maybe well, just leave the publisher side and... Let's make sure we're not the only panel that doesn't talk about ad blocking as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the sites make money. They don't, most sites don't charge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, um, the thing about the web is that most of the web is free in that you don't have to pay, but you'd have to pay in other ways, whether that's through data or, in this case, looking at advertising. It's the reality that we live in. If you pay for a site, then ads can be blocked, no problem. If you don't pay for the site, then you have to give something else up and if that's allowing an advertiser to put their message in front of you, that's the contract that you have with that website. It's tough though, isn't it? So I think if you've got great content, so if I looked at uh, 4OD or All4 now or ITV Play in the UK, that if it detects your ad blocking software, then it prevents you from watching the content. And if you want to go and watch Downton Abbey or This Is England on those two platforms, then you probably have a motivation sufficiently enough to actually go, okay, I'm going to enable ads. And I'll be patient enough to sit through a couple of ads to go and watch that content because I love Downton Abbey. I don't actually, but just for record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're in the business of content that's much more of a commodity, weather or news, then actually I think, would you be that motivated to go and kind of unblock your ad blocking to what gets that content? Because you can go to other sources to get it pretty easily. And that's why we needed to be very, able, very good in building up not just weather forecast as a service, but build up a kind of story that engage the customers, yeah. providing yeah. them additional unique content that are teaching the customers about the weather. Yeah. It's not just you know, giving forecast. weather forecasts. Yeah. Okay. And what we notice in certain countries where weather is basically less impacting than the US because we don't have hurricane or storms, mm. there is actually a lot of going on with the social weather. Mm. People just enjoying to share with their uh, relatives, friends, how oh, look here, how good is the weather compared to the rubbish weather you have in England. And then weather became <laughs> very popular Today's in countries example, like yeah. Italy, <laughs> Spain, <laughs> Brazil. And you just notice the weather is really related to every aspect of our yeah. life. Yeah. So for us, I mean, we want to try to build up this experience. We know perfectly that if we charge the consumer to go on weather, they would go to another website. Mm. So we're not just looking at the weather forecast itself as a product, but telling a bigger message. It, it's a balance, isn't it? You, you either, I think the, the web and, and our consumption of media is going to go down two strands. If you don't like receiving ad advertising and you have a problem with it, then pay for it. Mm. It's as simple as that. If you can't afford to pay for it, you don't want to pay for it, then you have to do something else. And at the moment, it's advertising. Yeah. Or in Facebook, I guess. Very, I mean, much. even if you look at something like Spotify, like again, if I did show of hands who actually pays for Spotify Premium, I imagine anyone actually pay for Spotify Premium? Well, that blew that face. <laughs> 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 exactly what I thought. <laughs> 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 but it's, it's the same with Netflix. Yes, yeah, so people will pay. <laughs> Netflix, you know, I, my kids watch Netflix because if they go onto the Disney Channel, it's just ad after ad after ad. Mm. They're I want that, I want that. <laughs> it's, it's not, especially running up to Christmas. We had the toy show coming up, they'll, they'll probably watch that as well. But there, I, I, well, in fact, there should be. I, I, I like advertising, I've done very well out of it. Um, I have nothing, not a bad word to say about it, but if I can, if, if I can buy my way out of it, I will. And Netflix yeah. does that for um, me. I, I think, part, Spotify. I think <laughs> part, part of the problem with, with ad blockers, though, is that it's, uh, it's basically a, a one size fits all thing. So mm. if you've been going to yeah. a handful of sites, and you get pissed off with the excessive advertising, you know, kind of on, on those sites. And so you download an ad blocker, you enable that, and then that blocks ads across everywhere. So then you go to somewhere with a bit more premium content and the ads are blocked on there, then you might kind of think, oh, I'll turn it off because I really want to visit this, this particular site. But then it becomes a bit of a chore, and you're like, well, actually, I can get this content somewhere else, and you just, over time, will drift away from that. So it's something, it's a bit of a lowest common denominator,
problem. And I think you know people talk about publishers um, improving their, their content, improving their ad experience on the site, whether it's through video or whether it's display advertising. And that's great for those publishers that put in the effort and do that, but you still might not disable your ad blocker for that better experience because so much more of the web is that lower level experience that you, you want to move away from. Yeah, one size fits all is a problem. As long as it's, I'll, I'll block everything with exceptions, then yeah. that would seem to make, make more sense. Yeah. And Ed, you mentioned sites like, um, you were talking about Channel 4, where you have some motivation to sit through the advertising because at least you want to see a, a content that you really want to see. Um, from, for the other side, where the, con the, the, the content is maybe shorter, it's maybe less uh, differentiated, um, isn't that maybe, isn't, isn't then maybe um, uh, targeting a, a, a better mm. way to try and at least have ads that are relevant to, as a way to, to regain viewers, or at least to um, you know, play with their patients a little bit more. But then targeting is an issue in mobile, right? So what are the options that publishers and advertisers have when we talk about um, well, targeting and programmatic? Well, when we discuss about the targeting on mobile, it really depends we are talking about mobile web or mobile app. Because on mobile web, we still can use cookies and we can still target users in the same way we do on browser. It doesn't change much. Uh, in case of mobile app, of course, it becomes more difficult because uh, uh, sometimes uh, it's hard also to manage uh, device IDs. Sometimes you could, based on the country, uh, crash with the privacy policy, so you have to be very careful if you collect first-party data how you're going to use to target the users. I mean, it's opening a, a kind of a window mm. to much more challenges that we're going to face soon in terms of data usage and privacy policy protection. But definitely, I mean, uh, when we're dealing with mobile, especially for a product like us, we are able to combine weather data with the location. This means that we can recreate a very strong, powerful advertising mm. trigger the advert when there are certain conditions. In a hot day, walking on the Ramblas of Barcelona, you get a Starbucks promoting uh, the cappuccino with ice. I mean, it's a strong, powerful advert. It works at that time, so probably, you know, for us, it's a really... It's interesting. When we know. ask people about their uh, ad experience on Facebook, most don't say we want to see fewer ads. As people say we want to see more relevant ads. You know, and we're fortunate that we have logged in people across devices, and we have a pretty broad window in, into their worlds. So we know their likes, tastes, and preferences. So we can deliver ads. And in some examples, so use the weather example, uh, we worked with a... So if you're a cider brand that you know your sales go up, if the uh, temperature increases about 2% than the average at that time, and then using that weather knowledge as well as geographical location to kind of pinpoint ads, if that makes sense, yeah. Um, but however, we've also just launched TRP buying or TVR buying in this country where that's a relatively blunt instrument. So we have the tools and capabilities to do really discrete targeting, but it feels like we need to take the ad community with us on that. And our first stab at that really is broad, demographical, and gender-based targeting. So I think we need to maybe think about how we can demonstrate the value of the relevancy more. I think with, with targeting, there's so many nuances to it that, yes, in, in, a, in a digital world, you know so much about where I go, what I do. Um, but, you know, that example of, yeah, I'm walking up with the Ramblers in, in Barcelona, it's a sunny day. Um, so, but do you know to serve me a... Uh, an advert for Starbucks for a, an iced coffee or for an iced tea? Because an iced coffee, I might not like, an iced tea would be hit the spot perfectly. Or should it be that actually it's the bar next door should be serving me an ad for cider, but actually I don't like cider, so it should be an advert for <laughs> lager. <laughs> so, it, and in each of those situations, you could think that, yeah, this is a really targeted advert. And it would be, but it would be mistargeted because actually I'm teetotal and I don't like caffeine, so I want an advert for a smoothie. You do know it, we know everything about you, though, on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but <laughs> that's it, a joke, But that's actually. why you need to work to enrich your data so you know more and more but about I, your customer. How, how much... There's, there's so many nuances, though, to it. Yeah, that even yes. that huge amount of data that we have, are we capable of creating nuanced enough mm. ad campaigns, targeted campaigns that actually are entirely relevant. I think, you know, we, as, as marketeers, we talk about relevant ad targeting. Mm -hmm. But I think as consumers, we ignore irrelevant ads and we yeah. acknowledge relevant mm -hmm. ads. So if you're walking down the street, you see so many ads for, you know, on bus stations, uh, you, uh, 
you know, big billboard ads. And most of those you, you probably ignore, but then you'll see one for Spectre and you're like, oh yeah, Spectre's mm. coming out next week, great. And that's the one that you remember yeah. because that's targeted. It's, sorry, it's not targeted, it's just you've kind of self-selected yeah. that. So that sort of um, prescribed targeting that we try to do is almost never going to be as successful as that acknowledged targeting. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to be there. We are not going to be there yet because in certain cases we are still using probabilistic versus deterministic, so that is less accuracy. There is still a lot of uh, technology that needs to be adopted from buyers and uh, publishers to be sure that this data can actually be enriched, created, processed, analyzed and used to target consumers. So, I would say nowadays we still have uh, availability of data and insights that weren't available before. So we're definitely taking the right way. But I mean, when this process is gonna be completely, I'm not anyone to say when it's gonna happen, but we're definitely going there. You can start to uh, match uh, first party data with third party data, uh, with, uh, I don't know, behavioral, contextual, one day we will be able to tell you if my users prefer cappuccino or prefer a tea. No, yet. It's time to privacy but. as well. I think as, as an industry, we spent a lot of time thinking it's really, really bad to collect information about individuals and targeting and knowing their name. The, the reality, I think, is that a lot of people don't care. Um, yeah. I've, I've had conversations with people who are on Facebook and go, yeah, I get H&M ads on, on my Facebook, and somebody else, oh, I only get Matalan. What's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a certain status because yeah. we know a certain amount about people. And I think as long as, it, as an industry we are responsible with the information mm. to know that you're a teetotal versus like cider, then giving up that information people will like because it's relevant to me. It's only when somebody is on a, on a web, health website learning how to cope with AIDS and an insurance company comes along and says, I'm not insuring you because you went on this website, mm. therefore the probability is you have this condition. Then as long as we take a responsible approach, people will be okay with sharing more of the information passively. Than, um, than we think, I believe. And people are really concerned about uh, privacy because they think when we talk about data, they can actually get identified. Theoretically, the technology allows us to do that. Yeah. But we have government and you know, institution to protect them, so why to be concerned? Depending on what they're tracking. There's, people want privacy in certain parts of their life. In other parts, like preferences, um, when it comes to what they like to eat or drink, it's, it's fine, I think that's okay. It's, the more private parts of their life that people, rightly so, want to be more protected. But we can do that as an industry if we're responsible, so. It's also about the, the relevancy that Ed mentioned before and also about the value exchange. So if by tracking my, my you know, by having a cookie on a website means that I don't have to enter my username and, uh, and, and password every time that I go there, that's quite good. So I like being tracked like that. Yeah. But then if it means that you're going to serve me, kind of retarget me with the same ad for something that I've bought somewhere else for the next 10 days, then that becomes a nuisance. I think that value exchange and, and relevancy are absolutely key in that kind of privacy debate. We shouldn't be getting ads for hair care products, you and I, so. Yeah, that, that's basically <laughs> what I'm saying, yeah. I'll, I'll pause you just there. We still have about a minute for a question from the audience, if anybody is one at the front. Um, so then the natural tendency about the mobile video ad is going into pre-roll. Uh, and pre-roll, there's paradox because even though mobile content views and growing a lot, still demands people that supply and prices are price very high. Like in the US, it's about $30 on a premium publisher to go on a mobile video pre-roll. Well, there's the other way, which is called outstream or in content or in banner or whatever, which is like Facebook is doing. It's about to play music, but on premium publishers to enable them to actually monetize their revenue for mobile video, even without the connection to mobile video content. I'd like to hear the agency view, the publisher view around monetizing through in content uh, mobile video. So, from, from the agency view, um, I think that the, the wider number of, of ad formats and ad placements that we have, the, the better. You're absolutely right. The kind of uh, pre-roll can be very expensive. You also have the, that problem that Barbara was saying about the length of the video in comparison to the length of the content. Um, and it gets in the way a bit more. I think the, the more native kind of formats, such as the, the Facebook formats, uh, such as kind of in-feed 
uh, or kind of on, on page format, um, which happens in a, in a similar way to Facebook. They're just as good in terms of that, you know, being able to deliver the video to the right user. I think they're probably slightly better in that you're not forcing somebody to watch it before they get to the content that they want to watch, which can have a negative association. So having that kind of in-stream uh, or kind of in-feed uh, format is the type of thing, like I was saying just before, that you actually, you see something you're interested in, you pause and you watch it. Um, so for me, the, the, the more of that type of inventory we get, the better. So from my view, as I mentioned, we were launching TRP buying a couple of weeks ago and we had a quick kind of office audit on the amount of video formats you can buy right now in the UK. And we quickly got to 49. Mm. Which, yeah, and that was just kind of desktop knowledge, which I think then is confusing for the agency world. And, yeah. so, and I think that's adding complexity that's unnecessary. Um, I'm biased, obviously, but I do think in stream is the right way to go. As I said, having videos prior to watching content is like a tax. Isn't it? I'm taxed to see this content. I have to watch three, four, five, and that experience varies from uh, from publisher to publisher, from content to content. And clearly, they're using that that the amount of ads just to balance advertisers' demand. I think, um, but I do think in a in an in stream environment, you have to be much more respectful of the user's time. And I think there are some like not overlaying of the content. I think is important as well. And it's also harder, I think, for the um, creative to kind of stand out and to, gr to grab your attention. Well, with that, we're officially out of time now, so please join me in uh, thanking the panel for uh, sharing all this insight with us. Thank you. Thank you.